First Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, and the only God, be honour and glory forever and ever. Amen. Timothy, my son, I am giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them you may fight the battle well, holding on to the faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers and intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Saviour who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This is now being witnessed to at, a, at the proper time. And for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Well, let's pray. Let's pray. Give ourselves this. Oh, God, as we see our dear friends on the screen there, um, our hearts go out. We want to see people from all over the world come into your kingdom to find peace with you. We pray for our friends R and E. Lord, sustain them, comfort them, keep them safe and their children and help them to hold out the gospel. We pray for ourselves this morning. Speak to us by your precious word. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, if you're wondering why I just called our friends R and E, it's because they're in a secure location. And so if you are ever putting something about them online, um, use those words. And as much and, and in terms of where they are, they're in the Middle East, and we won't be more specific than that for their security. They're doing a desperately important thing. And my prayer this morning is that our vision and our efforts would be directed like theirs, that our vision, our efforts would be directed where God's are, the gospel going to all the nations of the world. The gospel going to all the nations of the world. Have your Bibles open. Look down with me at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. That's what we're going to be in this morning. 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 7. As you uh, look at this, did you hear the word all ring out again and again in the passage? All. And I'm going to use that word all to kind of walk us through this in five points. First of all, Pray for all because of God's will for all, but there's one mediator for all. The gospel must go to all. Five things. Uh, just to warn you here, what's going to start fairly simple is going to go quite deep and complex in the middle, and that's going to be really good for us. So hang in there when we get there. First of all, number one, pray. First of all, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Paul says to Timothy in the hearing of the church in Ephesus, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made. Now, as we enter into this part of 1 Timothy, this is not the first thing Paul said to Timothy. So if you're here last week, we started our series called Welcome to the Family. Uh, Paul is the apostle writing to Timothy, his ministry trainee, uh, who's he's left in Ephesus. And he said, I've left you there so you can command certain men not to teach false teaching that leads people away from the gospel and a life of godliness, a life worshipping God that fits with that gospel. So stay there, Timothy. But because he said that, he said to Timothy, this gospel, this message is so critical. This message is Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners. Paul says, therefore, first of all, or of first importance because of this, pray. Three times he says it in this verse. Pray, pray, pray. He says petition, which means 
ask for things. Prayers, which means ask for things. Intercession, which means ask for things on behalf of someone else. Pray, pray, pray with thanksgiving because God answers prayer. Uh, as we enter into this passage, I wonder if that strikes you right now. First of all, pray. I wonder if you this morning have this deep sense yourself of the priority of prayer, that your life you, you could say, yes, first of all, I'm a person who prays. Or I wonder if you think that of our church. First of all, we pray. Is that true of us? What leads Paul to say this? Well, here's the second thing. See what he prays for. He says, pray for all. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, the kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Here's how big his prayers are. He says, what do you pray for? Pray for all people. And especially those in authority. What's the so that? What's this? So that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. What a good thing to pray for. When Annie was three, we were trying to teach her the fruit of the Spirit. It's very helpful for us as parents. It's like, how do you parent your child? You just go back, what's the fruit of the Spirit? <laughs> love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. I said, Annie, what's the fruit of the Spirit? She said, love, joy, Peace and quiet. <laughs> I think maybe she was picking up on something that we were praying for. But, you know, th- this big pray for all people, it's not, it's not for peace and quiet, like, like we have little peaceful and quiet lives. No, it's, it's about peace, being able to live peaceful and quiet lives in a society where at the same time you're free to worship God. You live a life that's godly. That is, it's devoted to God. It's holy. That is, it's actually set apart for God, different to the people around you. that You can do that peacefully and quietly because you're free from persecution and struggle for doing so. And Paul says that's good. It pleases God, our Savior. It shows, doesn't it, this is the kind of the end game of Christianity. Why? You know, when you become a Christian, right, you're not just saved from things, like from your captivity to sin and death and the devil and just doing what everyone around you does. And just say from this, you're also saved for something, which is to worship God, right? For godliness, to live to please Him. So our vision statement is that there'd be an endless crowd of people from all nations worshiping Christ as King. Paul says, pray that that could happen. And so pray for all people, especially those in authority. I remember um, when I first went to uni, which is the University of Newcastle. And uh, I was at a prayer meeting, and we split up, and I was praying with two older students, uh, James and Alice. And we, had the, we were given the topic, you guys pray for the world, and especially for the leaders of the world. And I was sitting there, I was like, I've got no idea what to pray for. <laughs> what do you pray for when you pray for the world? Or for leaders? And so I just let James and Alice go first. And that's my tip if you're in a prayer trip. And I, I listened to what they prayed for, and I learned from them. And it was wonderful because their prayers are so formed by the Scriptures, so formed by God and His will. Uh, they, they pray things like this, God, please give our leaders the humility to fear you, to do what's right in your sight. Please give our leaders a good conscience so they pursue justice and peace for all people. Please give our leaders compassion like you so that they'll show special, lead us as a nation to show special care to the outcast and the poor, the foreigner, the refugee, the widow. Lord, please make our nation one where people can worship freely so that we might be free to worship you. Are they wonderful, rich, scripture-filled prayers? But they didn't stop there. They pray for something bigger and deeper. Now, some Christians and political groups do stop there, just concerned for a freedom of religion. James and Alice didn't stop there. This passage doesn't stop there. There is something bigger. Do you see what it is? Look down. You'll see it there. Why is it, first of all, pray for all? Well, it's because of this third thing. It's because of God's will for all. You see there, verse 3, this is good and pleases God our Saviour, who wants all people to have religious freedom 
No, that's not what it says, is it? Who wants, what does it say? Who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And friends, here's the biggest thing in the world. It's not our liberties. It's that God is our saviour and he wants all people to be saved. And James and Alice prayed like that. Above all, they would pray, please, God, save our nation. Save our leaders, have mercy on them, and not just on ours, but on kings and leaders around the world. And uh, if you've been coming to church, I want to say the people who lead us in prayer week by week lead us in a wonderful way with these concerns. That's what we pray for. Please, Lord, bring the world to its appointed end of people worshipping you by saving people, people from all the nations, especially the leaders of the world. As big as they are, as bad as they might seem, they're not too big or too bad for our God to save them. He is the saviour. Now, as you think about particular leaders, and, and for some of you who've come from really difficult countries, where Christians are persecuted, where leaders are corrupt at all kinds of levels, you might think that seems like an impossible prayer. That seems like a crazy prayer. And as Paul's writing to Timothy in Ephesus, it might be that the Ephesian church thought the same thing. He's writing around AD 62 to 64, sometime in there before he is imprisoned again. And it was in AD 64 that the first state-sponsored organized persecution of Christians broke out under Emperor Nero. There was a great fire in Rome in AD 64. It destroyed large parts of the city. And Nero, to kind of shift blame from himself, threw it onto this, this new kind of what he thought was a sect, these new Christians. He accused them of causing the fire. And he persecuted them brutally. Uh, according to historical accounts, like from Tacitus, he uh, ordered the arrest of any Christians. They were tortured, crucified, burned alive especially if they wouldn't repent of being Christian. Some were covered in animal skins and torn apart by dogs. Others were human torches in Nero's gardens. Pray for that leader, as big as Nero, the ruler of the known world, as bad as Nero. Save Nero. And Paul says, who is our God? He's... The Saviour, he is the one who saved me. Chapter 1, verse 15, the chief of sinners. Paul says, I was that man. I was the chiefest of the worst of sinners. I was a persecutor, a blasphemer, a violent man. I took what I knew and I tried to use it to end Jesus through killing his people. And he saved me, says Paul. So pray. Friends, pray. Pray for the leaders in the Middle East that our friends have asked us to pray for. Pray for the leaders of the world. Pray for Mr. Albanese. Pray for their salvation. Pray for a society of peace where the gospel can spread to all people. Do it as you you gather with us Sunday by Sunday. But also, can I say, make it part of your personal prayers. Uh, Make it part of your personal prayers. I use prayer, mate. It's a way of having lists of what to pray for. And uh, on one of my lists is leaders of the world (laughs) and our government to pray for different concerns in our society. And I also want to say, um, if you're here and visiting this morning and you're exploring Christian things, I want you to know that um, you've been prayed for. You've actually been prayed for. Maybe generally by us as a church as we pray for people that we don't know or perhaps by the person that you're sitting next to. A family member, a friend, someone who knows you, cares about you, has concern for your eternal future, has prayed for you. I don't know know if that makes you feel weird or loved, (laughs) self-conscious or thankful. But know that because they have concern that you would be saved. Now, as we come to this verse, though, that God wants all people to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Here is the complex thing, though, in this passage, isn't it? It's kind of two, but here's one of them. Because it raises a really significant question. Uh, Did you wrestle with this in your small group this week? 
if God wants all people to be saved, why aren't they all saved? <laughs> right? Why isn't there like 100% Christians in the world? If he wants all people to be saved, why aren't they? Okay, so one option. Is it because God can't or won't? Or is it because, well, he actually doesn't really want to? He says he does, but he doesn't really want to. Now, we have to be careful here. An, an uncareful answer in both cases could attack God and diminish the mission of the gospel. So let's go to the first one. Is it because God can't or won't save people? Well, this is what has been argued by some. Uh, it's a position called Arminianism, where God wants people to be saved, but doesn't actually save them. And the issue here being uh, contention is faith. The Arminian argument is that faith is something that we do. And so their picture of salvation is something like this. God builds the car and it's up to us to drive it. That's kind of what salvation looks like. God builds the car, he does all this, he sends Jesus, dies on the cross. It's up to us to drive it. We have to believe in Jesus. That's that's what saves us. Now, what's the problem with that? Some of it sounds right, doesn't it? But no, there is a deep problem here. Uh, because uh, as J.I. Packer points out, and many others, Arminianism made man's salvation depend ultimately on man himself. Saving faith being viewed throughout as man's own work, and because his own, not God's in him. Key thing there, you say man's salvation depends ultimately on man himself. God is not our saviour. What is he? He's our potential saviour. Every time you say God is our saviour, you've got to put the word potentially in front of it. Maybe. You got, he, did a, he did a pretty good job. We just have to do the rest. But friends, is that the kind of God we meet in the Bible? No, Psalm 68 verse 20 says, Our God is a God who saves. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners not die, so that they might save themselves. Now, he is the one who brings us from being dead to alive again, lost to found, captives to being ransomed and free. He's the one who gives us faith by his spirit to believe. That's it, faith itself being a gift. God can and he does save and he does it alone. Yes, when you believe, you're acting in, you know, you're trusting in Jesus. You do it because God is the one who's worked even in that moment. So it's not that first option, right? Why is it that God wants all people to be saved, but they're not? It's not because he can't or he won't. So how do we understand it? Well, is it that God doesn't really want all people to be saved? Maybe one possible option put forward here is that all people means all kinds of people, you know, like Jews and non-Jews, the Gentiles, the nations of the world. Now that's possible, certainly. Paul uh, refers to his appointment as the apostle, the herald, the teacher of the gospel to the Gentiles in verse 7. Do you see that there? This concern for both Jew and Gentile is in this passage. But I'm not sure that that will do. Why? Well, it's because the framework for all seems to mean, without distinction, yes, but it means that because it literally includes all people. It's all, if you like, is the opposite of one. That there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The all there is literally all. So how do you understand this? Well, uh, this is the deep part. If you, hang in there if you can, if you can't. I'll like snap my fingers and you can wake up again. How do, you, how do you work this stuff out? Well, this is really important. When you read the Bible, you come across something you're not sure about. What do you do? Well, you've got to think systematically. That is, you've got to understand the whole Bible, think it through, think about its implications. It's all going to hang together and be true because it's God's word. And you need to think really carefully about the thing in front of you, exegetically. That is, what is it saying? Pay careful attention. So let's do that a little bit together. So thinking about the whole Bible, reflecting on it, and, uh, and also listening to Christians from the past. Here's something about God's will that I think is so helpful for us. What does it mean for God to will this? Well, God's will can be described in two ways. His will of decree and his will of command. God's will of decree, it's what he wills to do from eternity. His will of command is what he commands us to do that pleases him. 
So let me exp- give you an example. His will of decree is what he's going to do from eternity and certainly will take place. So, for example, 1 Peter 1, verse 18 to 20. Before the creation of the world, God chose to present Christ as a perfect sacrificial lamb. Right? So that's God's will of decree. He's decreed that this will take place, and it certainly comes about. And you might think of other parts in the Bible, like uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 2, that says, Before creation, God chose a people to be holy and blameless through Christ. It's the same in Ephesians 1, verse 3. Or in Romans 9, that before creation, God chose to have mercy on some and not others, destining them to receive mercy through the gospel. This is God's will of decree. There's also God's will revealed to us in the Bible of command, where he commands us to do what pleases him. I'll give you an example of this from 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul writes to the church in Thessalonica, it's God's will that you be sanctified, that you should avoid sexual immorality. It's a similar thing in chapter 5 verse 18. It's God's will that you give thanks in all circumstances. Do you hear here God's will, his will of command, it, it, what pleases him that we should do decree what he will do in the future unfailingly command what pleases him that we should do now i think in this passage chapter 2 verse 4 of timothy we're looking at god's will of command what pleases him do you hear that in the passage this is god's good and uh, this is good and pleases god our savior even the words that are used are kind of passive verbs it doesn't say that God saves everyone. His will is that we be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what he desires of us and what he decrees to do. All right, snap. So we, went, we kind of went deep into some theology. We're thinking about how do you read the Bible? How do you fit things together? Have you got some big categories in your head now for thinking about the will of God? What's this actually teaching us right here, though? It's teaching us this. God wills all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. This is what pleases God, right? You want to know what pleases me? Well, a thick shake, this chocolate, a back rub, an hour to play basketball. What pleases God? People be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. All people. He's the God who so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. The God who takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but calls them to repent. The God who is immensely patient with sinners. The one who all day long holds out his hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. The God whose greatest concern is to lift up and glorify his son as the savior of the world. That's who our God is. That's what he's like. And his will is that all people be saved. And so what does this mean for you? You might have walked into church wondering if there is a God or wondering if there is a God, what he's like. And if you're wondering what he's like, well, what does he want? What, what, What does he want for my life? I can actually, pretty confidently, I can tell you God's will for your life right now. You ready for the secret? <laughs> he wants you to be saved, <laughs> right? It's God's will for your life. He wants you to be saved, which says something straight away. I must have a problem. <laughs> there must be something big hanging over me, some, some massive issue in my life that I haven't even seen before. I have to be saved from it because that's his whole will for my life. Not only that, I must have been ignorant of something massive because I'm coming to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will. And now you know. And you know it not just for you. You could nudge the person next to you and like, hey, I know God's will for your life. <laughs> so you'd be saved. <laughs> Friends, this is what must form not only our own lives, but our vision for life. The will of God for every person that they be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And and Paul then grounds this on this fourth thing, right? He grounds it on this. He says, first of all, pray for all because of God's will for all and ground it on this, for there is one mediator for all. You see that verse 5 and 6? There is one God, one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This gospel, which means good news, it must go to all people from all nations because there's one mediator for all. It is, do you, you see the truth here? You come and understand the reality that the Bible brings to us. Not many gods, but one. Not many ways to that God, but one. 
Not different for different people, but one. And how is that achieved? Through one ransom. Now, friends, this is the most inclusive message you can ever hear. Because it means that whoever you are, this God wants you to be saved. He wants you to come and find peace through this one mediator between you, one person who can bring you to God, through one ransom that's given for you. It's the most inclusive message. It's for every single person, no one left out. And you also hear at the same time, it's the most exclusive at the same time, right? No other God, no other mediator, no other ransom, no other way. Now, why is that? Well, it's because of the man in the middle, the mediator, the unique nature of Jesus Christ. He is the only one who can bring peace between God and mankind. Because he himself is fully God. Come into the world to save sinners. Doing so by taking on our nature as a man. The man Christ Jesus. And so as both God and man, he can make a ransom that's sufficient for the sins of the world. The Bible says in Psalm 49, verses 7 to 8, no one can redeem the life of another. No one can give to God a ransom for them. The ransom of a life is costly. No payment is ever enough. No no one in this room can buy your life for God. But God can do it. By the infinite worth of Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all. Just that, imagine this with me. Imagine that you're traveling overseas, you're in a foreign country, and you broke the law. Maybe you brought drugs in your bodyboard bag. It's happened to Australians before. Anyway, you broke the law. You were in prison there. What ransom would be enough to free you and bring you back home? It would mean the Australian embassy getting in contact. It would mean your parents stumping up bail money to bring you out. Would there need to be an exchange of some kind to get you free? Now, this is hypothetical, but this happens to an American basketball player named Brittany Griner. Um, She's like seven feet tall. She's like one of the tallest women basketball players. She was going to play in Russia, start of a new season, and she brought uh, in her luggage some hemp oil, I think it was. Um, uh, So a drug, uh, which was fine in America to be used medicinally, but illegal in Russia. And they caught her, sentenced her to a maximum sentence. She was looking at years in prison. What did it take to get her back? Well, the people in America were trying to ransom her. Diplomats getting involved, the president getting involved. Trying to work out what's the price, what's the price, what's the price. In the end, the price was they had to do a prisoner swap where they sent back a man named Victor Bout, a Russian's arms dealer who had been sentenced for 25 years for terrorism-related charges to free a basketball player with a small jar of hemp. And... That's not the only prisoner swap that's been happening this year. Now, that's all happened, and then just after the biggest prisoner exchange that's happened between Russia and America since the end of the Cold War, 24 prisoners. Russia and Belarus had 16. Americans and their allies released eight prisoners and two minors. What is it going to take to get back? But friends, think about it like this. Imagine now, it's not just, just one person, it's not just 16 people. Imagine the whole world held captive. And what if the crime wasn't something as trivial as drugs or as as trivial as terrorism? What if it was treason against the majesty of God himself? What ransom could be offered? Well, there's, there's no one who can make an offer, is there, for starters? They're all in prison. But there's also nothing valuable enough to offer. What can you offer for another person's soul? What could make up for the most treasonous thing you could possibly do and rejecting the God who made us. Now, friends, the only hope for you and I and for this world is the mediator, Jesus Christ. The one who came into the world to save sinners, who by the infinite value of his own life, given to death on the cross, paid a sufficient ransom 
You know, were there 10,000 worlds filled with 10,000 people 10,000 times over? The value of Jesus' life would be enough. If you're, thinking, you're sitting there thinking, this couldn't cover me as well. My friends, I want you to know it certainly can cover you. That he has died for you to bring you to have peace with God. That this couldn't cover my neighbours, it can cover them. This couldn't cover our country, it covers our country. This couldn't cover our world, it is sufficient for all people and able to save. Indeed, the ransom of Jesus is the only possible thing that can. Friends, first of all, pray for all, because of God's will for all, for there is one mediator for all. Do you see how deeply this has got to shape us? That it means this fifth thing. The gospel, the news of Jesus must go to all. This is where Timothy, uh, Paul goes to Timothy, he says, chapter 2, verse 6, this has now been witnessed to at the proper time. That's what's happening right now. This is the time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle, I'm telling the truth, I'm not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. Paul's being sent with this news because it's like, this is the time. This is the proper time. Or to, to phrase it slightly differently, this is the witness for our own time. Now is the time for the gospel to go to the world. The news of Jesus to the world, for people to be called, be saved, come to a knowledge of the truth. There is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. That's what time it is. Every time you hear that, it's the, it's the fire up, focus kind of call to us. Um, I loved watching Michael Jordan documentaries. That's safe. Uh, what places you, Josh? And I was 18. That's what I would have said, Michael Jordan documentaries. The Chicago Bulls had a pregame huddle, and in it they had a rallying cry. It was a question and an answer. It focused the team. It fired them up. Uh, it went a little something like this. Y'all realize we're two and one, man. We're not one and two. Let's go out and play this thing, all right? Let's be ready to run now. I like that. What time is it? Game time. What time is it? Game time. Friends, every time they went out to play, this focused them, fired them. They knew the time. They were about to walk on the court. Every time we gather at church, this has got to be in our ears, right? What time is it? It's gospel time. Right? We're getting together. We're coming to that clarity. This is the moment, the proper time, the appointed time, our own time. It's the time of the witness of the gospel to the world. One God, one mediator between God and man. For all people. And the only way, the only way people can be saved. It brings out some really obvious implications, doesn't it? It means that the people we love, we want them to know Jesus. But it's not enough, is it, to pray just for our friends and family. It's not enough to pray just for where we live, pray for the western suburbs, pray for, our, uh, for this country. No, the extent of our prayers and concerns and our efforts must match the content of the gospel. Right? The extent of our prayers, concerns, efforts must match the content of the gospel. One God, one mediator, one ransom for all, witness to now. So friends, this is what we're seeking to do. An endless crowd of people from all nations worshipping Christ as King. Making deep disciples of all nations, ever increasing number. Prayerfully proclaiming the gospel, planting churches, partnering with missionaries. Setting our sights where God sets them. Our God who is Saviour. What does that mean practically? It means this, right? We... We, as a church, don't outsource kind of sending people to the nations of the world. It's not something that we just think it'll happen through someone else. It'll happen through societies and colleges. Now, we actually own that as something for ourselves. That we want to stir each other up for this, inspire each other, keep preaching the gospel to each other. We want to equip each other for this. We want to take responsibility for this under God and his sovereignty. And I want to say, I just want to commend you on being that kind of church. I think you live and breathe this. And people who love the gospel and are concerned for this sniff this out. They sniff it out and they they see that amongst you. 
Um, often there are residents training to be missionaries overseas at St. Andrew's Hall in Parkville. And they come here for church while they're there. So they're there for six months and they come here whenever they can. Why is that? Well, it's, I'll tell you what, it's not because we do a particularly good job of supporting them. <laughs> and it's not because we uh, take them on as formal mission partners after either. We don't do either of those things. And we're not particularly close to where they live. So why do they come? Uh, well, they tell us. It's because they come here and they find a people who are deeply concerned for the gospel to go to the world. And they're refreshed. And they're encouraged. By the way, if someone can take responsibility for us as a church, caring better for those people, please come and talk to me about it after church. It's a significant ministry we could have. We really want to do this well. And how would you know if you are that kind of person? If you're that kind of person? Well, I think one of the ways is you can go into the house of a person who's deeply concerned for the gospel to go to the nations. And you can work out if that's the case by going and looking at their fridge. You go and you look at their fridge. Uh, because often it's a bit like this. There, there are more photos on their fridge than there is fridge space, right? There's the photos of some friends and kids and pets and the holidays. But most of them are kind of like falling onto the floor and they're actually behind all these other photos of compassion children and mission partners and prayer points. And my grandparents' fridge was like this. I mean, I was one of five grandkids. There's like one photo of me on the fridge. There's like eight of their missionary friends. <laughs> and we were sort of like down the bottom, around the sides, and like, you know, top, top row where you'd see them most regularly. The people they prayed for every week overseas, boldly taking the gospel to Papua New Guinea and other places. The friends that we heard from this morning, r &E, they are great personal examples of this. If you went around to their house uh, before we sent them out, um, you, you might remember that uh, the first place they lived, their dinner table was next to an internal window, a glass window. Into like that led to a sunroom. And so as they would eat at the dinner table, they had written on the glass window a calendar, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then under each, they put the thing that they're going to pray for. And what are the things in the list? If you joined them for mealtimes, you'd have joined in the prayers. It was people around the world, leaders of the world, unreached peoples of the world. They prayed. They prayed first went into their diary, it shaped the rhythms of their life. How they were prepared in their own hearts to do something difficult, dangerous, courageous, and go for the gospel to an unreached country. Friends, uh, in, in 2022 as a church, um, one of our big prayers and plans was that over the next five years, we would send out our own homegrown missionaries overseas. Our, our friend, uh, as he finished his address to us in the video, he said, we pray for you, Laneway, that you would send more people out. We pray it would be you. There are not enough people who've gone. So take up your cross here, but could you also take it somewhere else in the world where you could bring the word of God so that people come to know the truth and be saved and find peace? Can I tell you a story just about how this has been bearing fruit? So two weeks ago, I got a letter from Daniel Milford. I might have a picture of him coming up. So Daniel came along to church here when he was 16. He, he, was, he came before he'd actually launched as a church in, in 2016. Um, and, uh, and he's been around part of things for the last uh, eight years. Um, this year, he's part of the team that's launching Anchor Church. Uh, Daniel has been loved. He's been trained for gospel ministry, serving in church here. He wanted to go deeper and he joined Incubator, learning how to share the gospel. He pursued further theological study at RTC. He's going to plant a church. And two weeks ago, he sent me a letter saying, I'm about to start a ministry apprenticeship with the hope that this will prepare me and my wife, Hannah, to go as missionaries to Taiwan. I'm just like, wow, there is an answer to prayer. There, there is an answer to our prayers, friends. Someone in our midst, he's not sure that's exactly what will happen, but he's saying, that's what I'm going to get equipped for. Under God, maybe he could use me. Can I say, friends, pray for Daniel and Hannah. Uh, the photo at the top corner, that's with our kids, taken like five years ago. The photo, the larger one, is Daniel and Hannah holding their first child uh, 
happy, perhaps of and they're expecting one more. Pray for them, partner with them, give towards them as they start their apprenticeship. And so friends, as we look ahead, next 10 years, let us never lose sight of the nation. Pray. You do that at the global prayer night, do it in your own homes, do it at church, do it in your small group. Get trained. As many of you are about to do through incubator, deepen your knowledge of God and get a taste of cross-cultural mission life. Give. Let's meet the needs of our partners to keep them on the field to love them and encourage them. And encourage. Be the kind of church that lives and breathes a commitment and passion for the gospel to go to the nations. With open-handed generosity. With encouragement for those missionaries amongst us at the uni campuses. Let's pray for those things. I'll let us briefly and then we're going to pray further. Oh Lord, you are a good saviour. You're the one who saves us from our sins. Saves us from the wrath that we face. Saves us from an eternity condemned. We're so thankful for our Lord Jesus. Help us to cling to him all our days and hold this gospel out to the world. Set our sights where yours are. We ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen.